Good morning, everybody, and welcome to PSG of Mercer County. Uh, Special Service Group of Mercer County is here for you. Anybody that is in any kind of career transition, and in addition to saying good morning, we say happy Aloha Friday. And uh, normally I do wear my Hawaiian shirt. Today it's a little nippy outside, first full day of fall. I'm wearing my um, Aloha hoodie. So I actually found one, I bought one. So uh, I do have lots of Aloha shirts. And this one is my hoodie for the cool weather. So that's what I'm on, really long sleeves. And so uh, also today is National Great American Pot Pie Day. So happy National Great American Pot Pie Day. So uh, it celebrates that uh, toasty meal, typically includes a kind of a flaky crust and a, and a flaky bottom crust, usually filled with some sort of meat or vegetable, like a chicken pot pie or vegetable pot pie. So maybe being a little bit cool day, you may want a pot pie for lunch or dinner. Warm yourself up. So we get to celebrate uh, National Great American Pot Pie Day today. The Professional Service Group of Mercer County is a group that is here for you. We are here to provide you with any resources, information, a little bit of guidance, all to help you be more efficient and more effective in your own job search. We do have lots of resources for you. We hope that you can take advantage of any or all of them. Uh, among them, uh, we do have our LinkedIn group. It is called PSG of Mercer County. So go check the uh, LinkedIn group. Uh, and if you are not yet a member, join. Press the join button. Uh, now, if you join uh, right away, what we will do is put your request to join in pending status. And uh, about once or twice a week, we do check for people who are joining. And the reason why we just want to approve people who are joining, we want to make sure that they've either been to one of our in-person meetings or joined us virtually. We only want people who've attended PSG of Mercy County in our group. And the reason why is, People who come to our sessions, whether virtually or in person, they kind of understand the importance of job search, staying in touch with people. We're trying just to keep the name collectors and the list collectors out, people that are just joining the group for their own benefit. So that's why we just kind of put you in pending status. We have over 1,700 members in our group. They are all people that at one time or another, uh, ever since we started the group, have been to one of our meetings. Uh, whether in person or over the past few years uh, virtually as well. And uh, once you join the group, uh, participate. Feel free to participate. Um, if you uh, see a, a posting someone else wrote, you have a nice comment, you might just want to put a comment there, even something as simple as thanks for sharing. Um, or if you have some interesting information to share with the other job seekers, do so. You might have gotten an email last week about a terrific position that just doesn't apply to you. You might want to copy the content out of that email, paste it for others to see. Your activity on LinkedIn is to your benefit in addition to sharing and helping others. Because LinkedIn does have a search algorithm, and part of it we understand is that if you are active on LinkedIn, they can bring you up a little bit higher on search results. And that's important, not when someone is searching for you. When someone searches for you, you will be found. But they're searching for someone like you based on your profile and you're hoping to come up on that, that list. So activity we know is important for that. We do also have our website. Our website is psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org, another terrific resource for any job seeker. It is not just the landing page for our program, but it is over 120 web pages of content. There's a tremendous amount of information that's there. Uh, one section we have is the open jobs menu item right on the top. And if you click on that, you'll see um, the um, open jobs page that has links to seven counties, which is Mercer and the six border counties. And as you click in those links, you'll see companies based on within the counties based on job function or, or service area, I should say, like financial services or not for profit. We have links to those companies' career pages. So they're in that county, they're in that sector. There are over 2,600 company links that we have among those seven. So if you're looking for a position maybe a little closer to home, if you're in the Mercer County area or a service area, you can click on that section and you can find companies that are close to you. Just use that to create a company, a targeted company list or go right to those company career pages and apply to their open positions. So you can do that right from those pages. So another resource that we have for you through our website. 
All right. So I will just in a moment introduce uh, Bill and introduce Sean. And as a reminder, our ground rules, uh, please keep your microphones on mute unless you do have an active question. Uh, and then uh, you can ask the question. Uh, the reason why, we just want to make sure there's no accidental background noise with autumn coming, leaves are falling, maybe there's a uh, leaf blower. Your neighbor has a leaf blower going. We don't want that sound. Or a garbage truck or a large truck going past on your street. Just want to keep that from resonating into, into this meeting as much as possible. Um, so if you have a question, you could just unmute, say, excuse me, Sean, excuse me, Bill. Or if you prefer, type the word question, just the word question in chat. And if we see that, then that's kind of the digital equivalent of raising your hand. So with that, let me introduce our presenters this morning. PSG of Mercer County is pleased to welcome Bill Lachance and Sean Lavison. Bill Lachance is an independent financial advisor. Bill's firm offers a unique flat fee program that combines financial planning, investment management, tax planning, and tax preparation. Prior to launching his financial planning practice, Bill spent 22 years in corporate finance in the retail industry, and before that was a CPA with a large accounting firm. Bill has his BS in accounting from Bryant University and an MBA in finance from Indiana University. Bill is a certified financial planner as well as an enrolled agent authorized to represent taxpayers before the IRS. Sean Levison joined uh, WJL Financial Advisors, the same firm, as a registered investment advisor agent in December 2020 after spending more than 20 years in corporate finance including 14 years as the Chief Financial Officer of two separate divisions of RPM International. Throughout his career, Sean has always had a passion for personal financial planning, and that's ultimately what led him to join WJL Financial Advisors. Sean is a certified public accountant and holds a Series 65 license and passed the Certified Financial Planner exam in 2020. He is also a member of the Financial Planning Association, and a leading professional organization of financial planners. So PSG of Mercer County is very pleased to welcome back two terrific advocates of job seekers and uh, advocates and supporters of job seekers. That's Bill Lachance and Sean Robinson. Gentlemen, it's yours. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll just kind of flip over to, uh, let me try thing works here, what the agenda is gonna be. Um, yeah, this presentation isn't necessarily designed to be, you know, everything that you'd ever want to know, you know, any kind of uh, issues you might have during job transition. And by the way, we might have a little background noise in my house. We just bought a new house. We had problems with our appliances. We've been hounding them for the last couple of weeks. And this morning, they decided to show up at the appliances. But so I apologize, but if you hear any background noise here. But um, so at any rate, um, so it's not designed to be everything you'd ever want to know, but we try to pick the, the key topics. Uh, that we thought people may not be fully aware of that might help them navigate this process. So please ask questions. You know, um, you know, I obviously did this presentation uh, for years. You know, it live and and you know we would be interactive. Um, it's a little more challenging when it's online, but but please, you know, either either chime in. Uh, that's fine, or uh, throw a chat. You know, a question in the chat, and we'll keep an eye on that and we'll answer questions as we go. It tends to work better versus sort of waiting to the end. So. Uh, first topic we'll go through is uh, medical or health insurance, right? This is often a big issue for folks in transition. Essentially, you've got two options, right? Unless you're covered by, you know, a spouse or a significant other that has a group health insurance through their employer, you pretty much have two choices, right? One is to go to COBRA and two is to go on to the exchange. People tend to automatically think to go to COBRA without really, uh, you know, investigating what the possibilities are on their exchange. Uh, and it, it may, that may, Cape Cobra may be the right call, uh, but oftentimes um, uh, the exchange may be a better option. Um, and the reason being is depending on your income, um, you could qualify for uh, some subsidies. Uh, and that income threshold has changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Um, so essentially the way it works is uh, and you can sort of see on this chart that I've got up, that blue section is essentially where theoretically, right, the subsidies end. So now with a family of four, it used to be a cliff. Uh, literally, it was it was 400% of the poverty level. So when they made the switch, it was right around 105,000. And literally, if your income was $1 over that threshold, you lost the entire subsidy. Could cost somewhere up to $14,000, right, losing that one uh, one dollar of income, right? So it was very, very tenuous and very uh, tough for folks that were just over the income thresholds uh, as you went down the list. Uh, 
So when uh, coronavirus hit a couple years ago, they changed it so that that cliff went away and that it was more of a sliding scale. It's essentially based on, it's saying that you can afford eight and a half percent of your adjusted gross income. And so the difference between eight and a half percent of your adjusted gross income and the cost of your plan, okay, you'll get a subsidy to make up the difference essentially. Um, and obviously, if you had a very expensive plan, if you had uh, in its age, you know, these plans are uh, priced by age. Uh, and so, for example, if you had two, you know, 64 year olds and two 25 year old children on the plan, um, you know, they could have an income up to 370,000 in theory and still get some kind of subsidy, although it'd be very small. So they, they, the range is now where you can get a subsidy are quite large. Um, and what that sub premium subsidy is essentially is it's a tax credit that you're given in advance. Um, so essentially what happens is you forecast your income for the upcoming year. Doesn't really matter what your income was last year or the year prior. What matters is what is the income in the current year? You're going to estimate that income. That determines if there's a subsidy, a premium subsidy. That subsidy gets paid to the insurance company, but what it really is is a tax credit on your behalf. And then the end of the year comes and you do your taxes for the year. So it's an annual number that matters, not monthly. It's an annual number for this that matters. Um, and wherever it comes in, if you come in higher than your estimate, you're going to have to pay back some money to the government in the form of a lower refund or a higher payment tax due at tax time. And if your income comes in lower than your estimate, uh, on the other hand, you'll get some money back. So typically, if you're going to be getting a subsidy or qualifying for subsidy, which is now much easier to do, it's generally going to be more cost effective uh, to go on the exchange uh, than it is for COBRA. Because COBRA, essentially what you're doing is you're paying for the full premium right, for your, health, your group health insurance with no contribution by the employer, you know, and depending on, you know, the employer, right, the contributions can be pretty significant. So if you're going to qualify uh, for a subsidy on the exchange, it's generally less expensive. There are some caveats as a particular issue more in northern New Jersey, where all of the plans on the exchange are what they call EPO, exclusive provider organizations, which means you have to be in network. You can't go out of network. There are no out of network benefits, like a PPO plan you might have through a group, through a work. You might be able to say, hey, I'm gonna have a better deal if I go in network, but I'm, I can go out of network if I want. With these plans, that's not an option. So for example, going into New York, for example, for folks in North Jersey, um, typically not an option. South Jersey are a little more flexible. Uh, the, the AmeriHealth is a big provider down there and they have and they're a subsidiary of Independence Blue Cross in Philadelphia. So I think there are more options to go into Philadelphia on South Jersey, but, uh, but in North Jersey, for the most part, um, you gotta stay in New Jersey, right? You can't uh, go into New York. Um, let me see what other uh, topics on that. Um, so essentially New Jersey kicked in, they, they, we switched exchanges prior to 2021. Uh, uh, New Jersey used a federal exchange. Uh, so essentially when these plans were rolled out back in like 2013, the intent was that states would all set up their own exchanges, right? Uh, all insurance is regulated at state level. But a lot of the Republican states at the time resisted and didn't want to get involved. And so they offered a federal exchange that, that if they weren't willing to create their own exchange, they could use a federal exchange. New Jersey had a Republican governor at the time. And so New Jersey used the uh, federal exchange. In 2021, uh, or uh, 2018, I think it was, Murphy won and decided to switch to New Jersey, create their own exchange, essentially, which gives the state a little bit more flexibility and saves them some money because they would obviously have to pay the federal government uh, for access to use the exchange. But the exchange is simply that. It's just a marketplace for where if you have a plan, um, you know, you, all, all, I'm sorry, whatever uh, providers decide they want to offer coverage uh, to individuals, um, you basically can go in and pick amongst those. Um, the, other, the other misconception out there is people believe that, um, you know, hey, maybe I won't get an exchange plan, an ACA plan, um, but, but, um, but I can't, um, sorry, the appliance guy was giving a thumbs up, is he good to go, which I don't really know because I've been on here. But um, so at any rate, uh, the, um, what was I going to say, the uh, subsidy, oh, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, Oh, um, people think that I can go to an, another, I just go to the insurance company directly. The reality is when you go to the insurance company directly, you are uh, essentially, um, uh, you know, getting the same plan that's on the exchange. There are no differences. 
Um, so it really makes no difference. So in other words, there is no alternative to ACA, you know, an, ex an, uh, an exchange plan other than COBRA or, you know, being on a group plan or, you know, when you turn 65 Medicare. So, uh, and then again, the, um, that uh, removing of those upper limits, that was effective originally for 2020 and 2020, I'm sorry, 2021 and 2022. But then with this uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed this fall, that got extended for three more years. They didn't make it permanent because that plan got passed using a budget reconciliation. It would have been too expensive to make it permanent. So they pushed it out for three more years. So that issue of the cliff does not uh, resurface now until 2026. Um, the second little section that you see that's sort of in more of a reddish color, that is actually if your income below, falls below those that threshold, now you are eligible for not only a premium subsidy, but a cost sharing subsidy, which means you're going to get a higher, uh, you know, lower co-pays, lower deductibles, right? Lower out of pocket. On the exchange, there are essentially three tiers of plans out there. There are, are a bronze, silver, and gold. And the way it works is the bronze plans have the lowest premium, but the highest out of pocket costs, highest deductibles, right? Highest co-pays. Silver's in the middle, and gold's the opposite, high premium, but lower out of pocket. For the insurance companies, they're relatively indifferent, right? Across a large number of people, uh, it's just a question of whether you pay up front or you pay on the back end. And it should be, you know, actually equivalent for the insurance companies, but it could make a difference for uh, an individual. Uh, the one caveat, though, is that if you're going to have your income low enough to qualify for uh, these cost sharing subsidies, um, th it's important that you, you only get those on a silver plan, the middle tier. Um, so if you're going to be, you know, getting a cost sharing subsidy, you're almost certainly going to want to sign up for a silver plan. And then for that green bar section, that if your income falls below those thresholds, that is no, you're no longer on the exchange. And now you're going to be shifting to what's called New Jersey Family Care, which is Medicaid, uh, which is free. Uh, the, ch the challenge is the, the networks are much more restrictive. Medicaid reimbursements are very low. A lot of doctors don't want to mess with it, particularly in the more affluent areas. Um, so I've had clients do the opposite. They, they've brought their income up intentionally using Roth conversions, some other things we'll talk about later, to essentially get them out of the uh, Medicaid threshold and into the uh, sort of bottom tier of uh, uh, the ACA plans, which is still going to be a significant, again, I've got clients, single clients, uh, if your income is $18,000 a year because, you know, you're living off of unemployment or whatever it might be, um, you're talking about zero premium, you know, $250 deductible, uh, $750 out-of-pocket max for the year. So pretty favorable terms if you qualify for the maximum uh, cost-sharing uh, uh, subsidies. Okay. Uh, any questions on any of that? Oh, I got some chat. I see some stuff here. Uh, about Bill's content. It's, not, it's no questions for you. For you oh, no questions yet. Okay. All right. And let me see if there's any other topics that I missed here on this. Uh, like I talked about, the cliff got taken out. Uh, they also uh, reduced uh, the credits. I'm sorry, the credits for the those that were already below the 400000 were increased as well with these changes. Okay. Uh, a couple other things related to medical. Um, the IRS does allow once in your lifetime to transfer money from your IRA to your HSA. Uh, for those who are not familiar, right, health savings account, which is different than a flexible spending account, right? So there's really essentially two accounts where you're allowed to put sort of tax deferred money towards medical expenses. One is a flexible spending account, uh, which are offered through employers, part of a cafeteria plan. And typically what happens is uh, you could decide the amount that you want to set aside. You have to use it or lose it, although oftentimes you might have a little bit into the following year to use it up. Um, so you got to be kind of careful how much you put in there. Um, and it's sort of a one year at a time thing. HSAs are different. HSAs are permanent. Once you put money in, you've got the rest of your life essentially to use it up. Now, the difference is with an HSA, um, you have to be in a, a specific high deductible plan to be able to fund an HSA. And essentially what they're doing is they're saying, hey, listen, uh, they've probably done some research and said, if people have to pay deductibles and have more out of pocket, they're gonna be more choosy about, you know, what medical service they sign up for, whether or not that's a good thing or not, I guess is debatable. But from a financial standpoint, um, they believe that if you have people have higher deductible plans are gonna be more judicious about using medical care, it'll be cost overall less. And therefore as a sweetener to get those folks to sign up for those high deductible plans, um, that you're allowed, if you're in a specific high deductible plan that's HSA eligible, 
Uh, and doesn't mean not all uh, high deductible plans are HSA eligible. There's got to be specific criteria that it meets. Um, but if you are, and it's usually in the name of the plan, right, HSA somewhere, um, then you can fund an HSA plan, which is really like an IRA for uh, health costs. Essentially, you put money in, it's pre-tax. So if you're, if you're getting through an HSA through work, you're putting pre-tax money in just like you would into your 401k. If you can get your own HSA, which you can, like if you had a plan on the exchange, you can go ahead and sign up for an HSA, uh, start to fund it up to these limits that you see on the screen here and um, you get a tax deduction for it. So it's pre-tax going in, but unlike an IRA or 401k, it's also not taxed when it comes out. Only uh, investment vehicle out there that's really not taxed going in, not taxed going out. It's really the best investment from a tax standpoint out there. Um, and so really I encourage my clients, you know, uh, even the one, you know, to, to, to basically max out their HSAs. If, if an HSA plan even makes sense, and that's, that's debatable, it may not make sense that the plan that's offered, but if it does, uh, you certainly want to max it out even before you max out your 401ks and your IRAs, because unlike those 401ks and IRAs, you know, you won't get tax coming out and you basically have the rest of your life uh, to take the money out. You can invest it in the meantime, buy mutual funds, right, if you want or whatever, uh, and just invest it like you would an IRA and then use it down the road, essentially. Um, and you can you, you can reimburse yourself for your Medicare expenses. You cannot contribute to an HSA when you're in Medicare. Make, Medicare is not an HSA eligible plan, but you can draw from the HSA to reimburse yourself for your Medicare premiums, any out-of-pocket medical expenses. So HSA is a really good deal. So what the IRS does allow is once in your lifetime, you can move money from an IRA to an HSA. Now, my money in the IRA is pre-tax, so you can't take a tax deduction for it. You never pay tax on it, but you can move it over and then use it and take the money out and not pay tax on it. Whereas had you left it in the IRA and pulled the money out to pay for your medical expenses, you would have had to pay tax and potentially a penalty uh, if you're under 59 and a half. Okay. Uh, withdrawals from a 401k and IRA are not subject to the 10% penalty if you're used for medical expenses in excess of seven and a half percent of your modified adjusted gross income. Uh, so essentially, if you're able to uh, deduct, you know, medical expenses on your uh, Schedule A, if you would be eligible, um, then you can use that, you know, you could basically take money out of your A. So basically anyone who has significant medical expenses are able to use their HSA uh, to pay for those medical expenses, okay? And from withdrawals from an IRA, but not a 401k, can be used to pay the premiums. This is different than the out-of-pocket and from the line item above, but pay your medical premiums and not have to pay the 10% penalty if you've been collecting unemployment for at least 12 consecutive weeks. So the idea here is that for some folks that are on unemployment and in tough, you know, maybe in a tougher financial position, we're not going to penalize you if you need to take your money to pay your health insurance premiums. Okay. And HSAs, I, I forgot to mention, if you're over 55 or, or the year you turn 55 and over, you could throw an extra thousand dollars per person. So for a couple uh, for 2022, the maximum, if they were both over 55, that you could contribute would be $9,300, the $7,300 plus the 2,000 catch up. Although the one caveat is at least $1,000 has to go into this, uh, this one, each spouse has to have $1,000 into their own HSA. It's kind of like a custodial account, like an IRA. The $7,300 could get split between uh, the two accounts, however you want, okay? Any questions about any of that? Okay. Yeah, Bill, there's Go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah, the, echo problem. There's an echo problem. It's going to come back on and ask the question. I'm sorry. What was the question? I think he's having an issue with his mic. So there's like an echo. So he was trying to ask a question and then it was bouncing around too much. Oh, so we, okay. Do we wait or should we give up, you think? I think we're good. Yeah, okay. All right. Me? I'm going to pass it on to Sean. Then I'm going to make sure I get this to work. Oh, oh, hold on. All right. So wait, pass it to Sean. No, there is a question. Do you, do you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, go ahead, Alan. Net transfer HSA, can you also add after tax dollars in that same year, or does that IRA transfer account as that year's addition? So I'm, let me just make sure, Alan, I'm asking a question, right? So is the question, so you have a maximum you contribute to the HSA, right? Which is, um, let me just make, you know, so which is, let's say it's a family, right? $7,300. As the question, if you transfer $73 from an IRA to an IRA, that uses up your $7,300 contribution for the year. Is that the question? I'm just asking on behalf of GM, so maybe you want to join in. Yes, that's the, that's the question. 
Yeah, that's correct. That is, that's it. So basically your $7,300 contribution or thirty six fifty if you were uh, single, you're using that up for that year if you move it over from an IRA. But Thank you, you can only do that once, one time in your lifetime. So one year, essentially, you can make your money. Now, if you have the money in an aft, in a savings account or somewhere that you could fund it and take a deduction, you'd be better off. But if you don't have that luxury um, and your only option is to move money from an IRA, that's I did that actually my, my first year out because uh, I was short on cash uh, when I lost my job. Um, and so uh, basically, um, yeah, but that, that you're using up that allowance for the year by doing that. Anything else? Yeah, just one comment for all of us who are asking questions. Um, please send the questions to everyone, not just to David or not just to organizers. Um, that way, Bill and Sean will also be able to see it. They're not organizers. They're not, uh, you know, leadership. So just when you send the question, send it to everyone. That way we can all see it. And also the question gets recorded in our chat as well. So just the... Uh, little information for all of us but otherwise i think that's it for the questions online anybody here with a question no okay yeah let's move on all right pass it over to sean all right i get the challenge of trying to present tax information to you while keeping you awake let's see if i can do it so you know i'm going to go through some of the recent tax changes the last couple of years and try to highlight how this is going to impact you uh both this year as well as what you can do if you are going through an income transition um, in the next you know, year or two. But I'll start with the tax changes over the last couple of years, starting with the CARES Act in March of 2020. Now, I've kind of spinning this down. Obviously, these were large acts, but a lot of this stuff already expired, so I'm just gonna highlight the stuff that's still applicable and you know, might actually be applicable to your own situations. So first, I think most people are now aware that a lot of over-the-counter medications, including first aid kits and first aid items, are now uh, deductible through your FSAs, especially. I'm going to highlight FSAs because, uh, you know, in an ideal world, you shouldn't be using your HSAs. You want that to build up for later use in retirement. But if you do have FSA money available to you that's going to be used or lose it or expire, you know, you should look at those as options to kind of stock up at year end to use those, um, you know, available funds to you before you lose them. Um, the next one is the Consolidated Appropriations Act in uh, 2020. It was, it's of 2021, but it was passed in December of 2020. And uh, the one thing I want to highlight on this is the last couple of years, you've been able to deduct, even if you take the standard deduction, you've been able to deduct uh, $600 if you're married filing jointly. For charitable deductions um, and there was three hundred dollars if you were filing single as of right now for 2022 this is going away so you know it's, it's a minor impact it's a couple hundred dollars but i mean that you know it's going to increase your tax burden for this year if you're relying on a refund and that's what i want to highlight about some of these things going away um, the last one is also related to fsa accounts and that is that it, they allowed those to be rolled over from 2021 into 2022. You know, so if you do have 2021 money available, you want to make sure that you use that up this year, as well as any kind of balance you have in 2022, because that is not going to be able to just be rolled over into 2023. So that's something you want to consider. So continuing the Consolidated Appropriations Act, they made some changes to uh, college grant loan um, and deduction changes. Now, one thing that's really interesting, I haven't really talked to anybody who's had an employer provide this as a benefit, but because of people that you know are able to do the, uh, the dependent care deduction and have that benefit available to them, they tried to give something to younger workers that might not have dependents yet, but do have large outstanding loans. So they allowed the employers to make tax-free payments up to $5,200 towards their employees' student debt. Uh, so, you know, if you have uh, children or no younger workers, or you yourself have loan balances out there, you know, that's something that they should inquire with their employers if they offer, or ask them if they would consider doing it. Um, also along the line of college application process, they've streamlined the FAFSA application and they've reduced it from 108 questions to 36. And the terminology is slowly changing. 
although you know it's supposed to be changed from this expected family contribution to now it's called the student aid index which i guess is supposed to be less offensive and make people feel like they have less of a burden on themselves but i have yet to see this actually used in real life i still hear the expected family contribution used so um, just might be aware that the student aid index is a, is a term that's out there They've also eliminated the treatment of mortgage insurance premiums as qualified resident interest. So that also has not been extended. So if you did itemize and you itemized your mortgage interest, you know, and if you did have the, you know, the premiums for, um, you know, the loan origination, that's also going away. So that could possibly result in a tax increase for you uh, this year. Hello. Okay, no, I don't think that was for me. Um, all right, so then now we go forward to the American Rescue Plan in March of 2021. So this is a lot of changes for, um, uh, again, people with children or dependents. And I just want to highlight this, that if you are in that situation that you claim the child care, the child tax credit or the dependent care expense, you know, expense reduction, all this stuff that they did where they you know expanded the amounts i'm not going to go through each line because none of this stuff is applicable now it's all going back to the pre-2021 amounts and it's just something that i want to make sure that you guys are aware that if you did claim uh dependents or dependent care expenses in 2021 you know you want to make sure that you realize that your 2022 bill could be higher because these amounts are going from the 3,000 back to the 2,000 uh, the total amount of dependent care expense deductions going from the 8K that it was in 2021 back down to the 3,000. So when you're doing your tax forecast or you're expecting a big refund of $5,000 to, you know, fund your vacation and, and ski trip next year, just realize that you might be receiving less of a refund if these things are impacting you. Now, I think that a lot of people are still hoping that, you know, some of these will be uh, extended. But uh, all the tax stuff, the Senate is really not going to vote on anything until after November elections. So there's not going to be any update until probably mid-November on any of these. Um, and I don't know how that's going to go. I'm sure it depends on how the elections go themselves. So just keep be aware of this and how it could impact your taxes and what, when you're doing your tax forecast. I, I have a question about the last slide. Uh, okay. Payment of student debt. If one was changing jobs and hitting a negotiation ceiling on salary uh, where, you know, they wouldn't give you what you asked for. Could you ask for, you know, negotiate prepayment? Uh, uh, payment of debt? A hundred percent. I think that you, it is worthwhile to ask that question. I mean, this is something that's available to them to offer as a perk. And, you know, you might find, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the same cost to the employer, whether they pay you $5,000 of salary or 5,000 to your student loans. But at some employers, like large corporations, like you know I used to work for in the past, they have salary ranges for certain positions as well, you know, and they you might be capping out on a certain salary range or band or whatever they call it inside the corporation you're working for, but they might be able to give you some kind of perk like this, where it's student loans and it doesn't mess up their salary ranges. So, I would I would definitely ask those questions because you might find that some are flexible. Are you done with this slide, Sean? Yeah, I was done with this slide. I mean, the one line, I should just highlight one last thing. I'm sorry, Bill, I saw the last bullet on there. So the discharge student debt will continue to be counted, um, will continue to not be counted as income through 2025. And this was the precursor to the debt elimination that Biden just um, you know, offered to people with the $10,000 of debt forgiveness. So if you were impacted by that and you had debt forgiven, this is the reason why it will not count as income as other debt forgiveness would be um, considered. So you do not have to worry about that being income if you qualify for that debt to be discharged. All right, so then the last time I presented this slide, we had this proposed SECURE Act. And it was a lot of changes through to uh, different retirement plans, including phasing out the RMDs. But, you know, when I last presented this, you know, this thing flew through the House with a, you know, bipartisan vote of 414 to 5. And it looked at the time like this was really going to move forward. But now this has gone back into, you know, the limbo political graveyard as well. 
you know, I think because it had so much support, I think you will see this back on the agenda, but probably not until after November. So this is this is just in limbo, which is why I didn't uh, continue presenting this slide, but something to be aware of, it could be happening. Um, now the most recent act that's just passed is the Inflation Protection Act. It's got a lot of headlines. I'm sure that you have, have heard about it. Um, you know, whether it really, uh, you know, tackles inflation, I'm not really, you know, sure, because it's, infl I'm sorry, I said Inflation Protection Act, but it's Inflation Reduction. That's what it actually is called, not protection. That's a, that's a typo there. Um, but, you know, the major changes to it and the, the headlines talked about how it is enabling Medicare to negotiate prescription drugs. But what's kind of buried is that that actually doesn't start till 2026. So you're not going to see any of that uh, anytime soon. Um, it did, you know, immediately extend the ACA subsidies that, you know, Bill talked about earlier. You know, he kind of mentioned that those are through 2025. Um, and that's because of this act. And it's good because it provides a lot more um, you know, predictability to the healthcare system. There are people that are using the exchange. So that is a good thing. Um, the rest of the act is really focused on renewable energy and energy credits. So it's not really applicable to a whole lot of people, but if you are, you know, considering solar panels or any of the, you know, uh, energy efficient things to your house, they've now extended that credit through 3032. So you have a long time to kind of plan that out. And they've also increased it from the 26% to 30%. So just something for you to consider if you are thinking about one of those products. Um, lastly, it did a lot for the EV market, the clean vehicle credits. So you might've heard a lot about that on TV, uh, debating whether that has actually, um, you know, going to be useful for people. I'm really not sure because it came with a lot of caveats. So I'm not really gonna go through each one of these, these lines here because it actually increased all the restrictions that are needed to actually qualify for those credits. So a lot fewer cars are actually qualifying. And because, but the main goal of this was to A, bring more assembly back in the United States and also try to increase mining in the United States of some of these minerals that are used in the batteries. Uh, right now, very few cars are, are qualifying for this as it currently is written. So, you know, if you are considering an EV, you just want to make sure you do your homework to make sure that those cars qualify. There actually is a couple different uh, federal or government, I should say, websites that will tell you exactly what cars qualify and which don't. And one thing you're going to see is even though the new car and the new credits start in 2023, they did make it so that even the current EVs can only qualify, like if you buy a car in the remainder of this year that's an EV, then you're going to get the credit. Um, you just want to make sure that the final assembly is conducted in the United States because they added that restriction on even the current EV credit. So just something for, for you to consider. All right, that's great. A lot of tax changes, you know, uh, thank you for the tax lesson. But what do I actually do with this information, right? You know, you're, you're sitting on the job network club because you might have had a change to, you know, your income or job position. You know, you could have even taken a, a job that's making more money or you took a job like maybe you're maybe you're lost a couple months. You now have a new job that's making more money. But because you've had those months of unemployment, your actual income might be lower. Uh, but let's start with the uh, that scenario. Right. So. <clears throat> You know, your income is lower because you had a couple months of unemployment. Uh, so now, you know, you're wondering what can you do right now to take advantage of the fact that you might be in a lower tax bracket. And in order to figure out if you're in a lower tax bracket, that goes into kind of the tax forecast that we talked about throughout these other slides is you want to have an idea about what your taxes are shaping out to be in the current year to know what your tax bracket is. And if you're down the 12% tax bracket, but you know you're normally in the 24 or you're in the 22 and you know you're normally in the 32, then you know you wanna to try to consider some of the options that are presented here. And these are some of the strategies to accelerate income or defer deductions. So what you can do is you can take raw conversions up to an amount that will fill up the lower tax bracket. So that's converting your pre-tax IRA money into a Roth. Now, each one, each one of those conversions is a taxable event. It increases your income in the current year. So you're gonna have to pay taxes on it. So you wanna make sure that you have some available funds to pay those taxes. But when you do that Roth conversion, you're gonna lock in that lower rate 
when you know you know you're going to go up to a higher rate later. You could also sell some investments at a gain to lock in the lower capital gains rate. You know, uh, right now it's kind of a kind of a rough market. So if you had any short-term stuff, I'm sure that's not sitting at a capital gain. But if you've been holding stuff for a long period of time and you have large built-in gains, you know, you can sell those now and lock in this lower tax capital gains rate. To the extent that you're in the 12% tax bracket, your long-term capital gains rate on those gains would be zero. So you definitely want to consider that if you are in one of those lower tax brackets. Um, if you're over 59 and a half, you can withdraw money from your IRA. Uh, or if you're oh, un, I'm sorry, if you're under 59 and a half, you could still qualify with a couple of different exemptions, but you'd still pay taxes in the current year just at the lower rate. Um, and just a note, you could still contribute if you had funds as well, even though you're taking money out. So um, other options are if you separated at your company and at age 55 or over, you could withdraw money from your, your 401k and pay taxes at the lower rate, your current tax rate, without paying the 10% penalty. So it's something to be aware of. Um, now these are, the last two are more about, you know, deferring like uh, deductions or tax credits you might be available to, but you could pay your quarterly estimated income tax in January of the next year and defer your payments of real estate taxes until that next year as well. So then what you're trying to do is lower your deductions in the current year. Now this again, this is only if you itemize, uh, um, lower your deductions in the current year and move them to the next year, kind of doubling up your real estate taxes and your income taxes in the next year when you know you're gonna have more income and be at a higher tax rate. So they're worth more uh, at that level. Um, if you're at the lower income levels, you just wanna make sure that you're also considering tax credits you might not have been um, available to have. You might've been phased out because of your prior income. And some of those include the earned income tax credit, American opportunity credit, and lifetime earning credits. All right, so the next slide is is the opposite, right? Like you might have changed jobs in the current year and you were paid out, um, you know, a deferred in, a deferred compensation bonus or you were paid a, um, a severance, you know, payment and it, it's going to jump up your income in the current year, but you know it's a one-time uh, effect and next year your income tax is going to go back down to the, the previous brackets that's at more normally. So in this you know, case, you want to try to defer the income if possible uh, or accelerate deductions because, like I said, you're expecting to be in a higher tax bracket next year. So the first is, is an obvious one. You just want to make sure that you are making as much contributions to your tax deferred investments as possible. So that's your pre-tax 401k, your traditional IRA, any HSAs. You want to make sure that you're maxing those all out with the funds that you have as a one-time payment. Um, if it is possible, you know, de delay your deferred compensation to the following year. Uh, you know, that might not be an option for everyone. A lot of companies have, you know, somewhat rigid rules on, um, you know, paying that out. But, you know, there's also some things where, you know, you delay the paperwork to get it paid out. And if you can make it last, but like, you know, if it would have been paid out in December and you've installed it for one more month, you're going to be in good shape. Uh, you could also do the reverse of what we talked about, where you're kind of moving expenses in with the deduction. So prepay your January mortgage payment. So that way your mortgage interest deduction is in the current year and not the next year. Uh, you could consider utilizing a donor advised fund to lump charitable deductions. So if you're someone who has a lot of charitable deductions every year and you provide a certain amount of money to whatever your charity is each year and you've kind of committed to that, what you can do is you set up a donor advised fund. Now you have to pre-fund that. So if you're saying, okay, I'm going to do five years of $1,000. Well, you could set up a donor advised fund. You do have to donate that whole $5,000 in the current year. Um, but then you can distribute it to your charities that the $1,000 each year that they have kind of become accustomed to. So it's, a, it's an option that can make you be able to pull forward those deductions. Uh, now, you could pay your quarterly estimated state income taxes in December instead of January, uh, and you could do the same thing with your real estate taxes. So this is the reverse of what we talked about before. Now, that is somewhat limited because your tax deduction is capped at $10,000 right now. So 
you know, especially in New Jersey, you probably already hit that cap anyway without pulling it forward or playing in the other games. So um, the last one is to do the reverse of the capital gains. So if you do have stuff at loss, at losses, which is anything that you probably have at short term in these markets right now, you know, you could sell those, realize the loss, and then you can deduct up to $3,000 uh, in the current year against your ordinary income. Now you don't lose whatever the remaining loss is. So let's just say you sold it for, you know, say so you say you bought something at fifty thousand dollars, you sold it for forty thousand dollars. You have ten thousand dollars of losses that you just you just realized. Well, you can only claim three thousand in the current year, but each year you can use that next three thousand dollars each year until you fully utilize that ten thousand dollars. So it hasn't gone away; it just carries forward and gets rolled forward until you've used it all up. So those are kind of our strategies to both, you know, utilize the lower tax rate or the higher tax rate. So were there any uh, questions in the chat? I don't, don't see anything. So I don't see any questions in chat, and, uh, but uh, this could be a good opportunity. We're taking a little bit of a, I guess, a break in the slides. How about folks here, any questions? Some of this is, you know, could be new to us. Some of it could be, a little confusing, which is clearly why you speak to a professional like Sean or Bill, um, but this could be your opportunity to ask a question to get a little clarity. Yeah. So uh, the suggestion was to prepay or pay your estimated taxes in the Sunday instead of in January when it's due, when it's due in January. Uh, the question is, how does that make a difference when uh, the taxes because it's going to count with the test you know, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's hard. I, I got some of the question. I, I heard it was about you know, pre taxes. Maybe, maybe yeah, so that last uh, board before last one on this slide, it says pay for the estimated taxes in December instead of January. The yes. question is, how does that make a difference? Because when you file, your taxes still going to count towards the past year regardless, right? But well, so everything it, it on makes, cash base, I'm sorry. Yeah, it makes a lot less difference than it used to. Let's put it that way, because you know, back when you know there was no cap on itemizing, um, you know, it made you know you got to itemize your state income taxes on your federal return, right? So you're going to have a low, you're going to have a bigger deduction this year. So theoretically, that's still true, right? If you take if you prepay your if you do your state income tax, uh, you know, let's say you pay estimated payments, let's say you're self-employed, and you make your estimated payment in December instead of January, you get a deduction in December on your federal tax return. The reason that's not as big a deal as it used to be is that that overall tax is capped at 10,000. That's income tax and property taxes. And even then, you got to get over 25,000 of itemized deductions. So in theory, it's still true. In reality, very few people, it's going to make a difference. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I guess unless you can move to a, uh, a state that salt is not as much of an issue. Um, let's see, there is um, one question from GM, and that's in chat, so I'll just read it. <clears throat> if I'm on COBRA and have an HSA, can I add tax dollars to my current HSA up to my family limit as I have no employer to do this, to do the process? I assume then there is a tax form to make a note on my after-tax contribution to my current HSA. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, so you you, you have to make sure that so if you if you're on an HSA eligible plan all year, uh, and now you switch to Cobra in the middle of the year, you can make you can make up to your annual limit contribution, uh, and the part that wasn't pre-tax that came through the employer, you'll simply take a deduction, right, on your um, on your tax return for that. So the way it worked, you'll actually take it. So let's say the limit was 7,300 and, and you did half of that, right? Uh, well, let's say you did 4,000 while you were still working and now you can do another uh, 3,300. You would just put the 3,300 in, you have till April 15th to put the money in to the HSA. And then you take a deduction on your tax return for $3,300. And that's how it becomes pre-tax because you, you took a deduction for it. 
whereas you can't take a deduction for the 4,000 that, that got contributed to the employer because that was pre-tax to begin with. So you can't take a deduction for that portion of it. But for the after-tax portion of it, you take a deduction on your return. So for GM, was that clear? Or do you need a follow-up? All right. Got it, got it, thanks. Okay, anything else, folks, before the gentlemen move on? Yes, we'll move on. So the next topic is, uh, you know, if you're if you're leaving your job, you know, what do you do with your 401k or 403b, right? Do you leave it? Um, you really have three options, right? One is to leave it in the old company. Let's say it's a 401k. Leave it in the old company 401k. Second option is to move it to the new company 401k. And third is to roll it over into an IRA. So what are the pros and cons? So the, the pros of 401ks versus IRAs are, are two that are primary that, that we see. One is you can borrow against a 401k. You cannot borrow against an IRA. So for example, um, you're allowed uh, to borrow uh, up to 50,000 or 50% 50 of your 401k balance. Uh, and then you have to basically pay yourself back, um, right? With a, with a state, you know, there's a whole formula in terms of what interest rate you need to use. Um, so if somebody thinks they might need cash for something, uh, you know, borrowing money from a 401k is one option. Um, and so if you think you're going to want that option, then what you would want to do is move money to the new 401k because the old 401k will not allow you uh, to borrow against it, right? They want to be able to pay back that loan. Typically, when you borrow money from a 401k, you're paying it back via uh, payroll deductions, right? Uh, and they're not, you can't take a payroll deduction if you're no longer employed. So you generally, in fact, it's the opposite. If you leave a 401k, you generally have a limited amount of time, 60 days or something, to pay back the 401k. Otherwise, it's going to be treated as a distribution. Um, and what's something to think about, honestly, if you're switch, deciding to switch companies. But, uh, but, but if you do think you might want to borrow against it, right, in the future, you might need the money for something. One option is to roll the money into the new 401k, and then hope, assuming the new employer allows you to take loans. Um, the second advantage of it, and Sean had talked about this a little bit earlier. You know, with, I'm assuming mostly aware that with an IRA, if you take money out before you're 59 and a half, you're going to have to pay tax on it, but you're also going to have to pay a 10% penalty. Um, with a 401k, if you separate from service in the year you turn 55 or later, so let's say you you leave uh, the company in March and you, you turn 55 in November, that still counts. From that year going forward, you can take money out of your IRA, out of your 401k, take a distribution, and not have to pay the 10% penalty. So you have to pay the tax because it's pre-tax, but you don't have to pay the penalty. So typically what I advise clients who, uh, let's say they're 57 and they've left the company and they're not sure what to do with their 401k, if there's any chance at all they're going to want to use the money in the next couple of years, I generally advise to leave it in the 401k. The old Now, this one has to be in the old 401k because if you move it to the new 401k, you haven't left service when you're 55, this exception goes away. So there you'd be leaving money in the old 401k. You can draw it if you need it. Once you get to 59 and a half, it doesn't matter anymore. Then you could always roll it over to the IRA at that point. If those two aren't going to matter to you, um, then it generally makes sense to roll over to an IRA um, because there's some other advantages for the IRA. Uh, one, you know, there's no 10% penalty for first home buyers. Well, it typically doesn't uh, apply to folks in the, uh, you know, that we meet at these meetings. But the second one might, right? There's no 10% penalty for withdrawals for qualified higher education expenses. I'm actually doing this myself. Um, and so you can take money out of an IRA. And if it's for qualified higher education expenses, you don't have to pay uh, the 10% penalty. Okay. Uh, there's also, as I mentioned earlier, no penalty for withdrawal from an IRA, but not a 401k. This is, so if you, if you want to use this one, you got to move the money into an IRA first. Uh, if you've been collecting unemployment for 12 weeks, you can use money in your 401 IRA to pay for your health insurance premiums, okay? You have much broader investment options, uh, right, with an IRA than you do with a 401k. Now, fees-wise, it depends, right, uh, what you're gonna do. Uh, a lot of 401ks are pretty limited and often don't have the best investment options, and we're fans of kind of low, low cost index funds. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, and so, you know, but if you're gonna move the money out of your 401k into a, a managed brokerage account where you're paying, you know, 1% fee and, you know, and, and, and higher fee funds, well, then you're probably better off leaving the money in the 401k. But if you're gonna take it out where you maybe don't have the best fund options, you can move it over to Vanguard or Fidelity and get, you know, really low cost index funds. Uh, you know, you may be better off uh, and having more flexibility because um, you got much 
you know, you can pick anything, right? You can buy anything you want, not just the 15 funds that the investment advisor for the 401k had picked out for the, for the participants, okay? And then the other advantage of the IRAs, you can do Roth conversions, you know, which is a big kind of tax planning strategy for us, not necessarily just for people on transition, job transition, get a scenario where we see this a lot, are just folks that, well, I guess this sort of a job transition, right? Folks that are kind of in their 60s and maybe they decided to leave the workforce uh, full time and they're either working part time or they're doing some consulting or they're retired, whatever it is, but they're not 72 yet. They're, they're not 70, they're not collecting social security. They're not 72 where they have to draw the requirement distributions. So they're in a lower tax bracket, kind of what you alluded to earlier. And then there's all kinds of tax planning uh, maneuvers you can do and Roth conversions, uh, you know, is one of those to pay the tax at the lower rate, as Sean had mentioned. Okay. And then the other option is, it, and it depends on the company, right? Because some guys won't allow this, but if it's allowed, you don't necessarily have to do all of one or the other. You can move, you know, uh, leave some money in the old 401k and then move some money over to the IRA or, or move some of it to the new 401k and move all the rest of it to an IRA. You know, some companies will allow you some flexibility, some companies won't. Uh, but you don't necessarily all have to do one thing with it, depending on what your, your objectives are. Okay. All righty. These are just some topics on if you're forced to take on debt, some things to think about, right? Um, if you do have to take on debt, if you're in a financial crunch, uh, you know, obviously you want to tap your lower rate source of credit before, you know, credit cards or higher rate source of credit, things like home equity loans. If you've got a life insurance policy, uh, typically you can go to a bank even or from the insurance company and borrow against that. Uh, generally, that's certainly at a much lower rate than what you pay on a credit card um, than, you know, before taking on credit card debt, for example. Um, you know, understand even with credit card, the rates you're paying, right? Oftentimes cash advances, for example, might have higher rates or more restrictions than, uh, you know, purchases. So you want to be aware of what rate you're paying. Um, just in general, you know, you want to verify your, you know, you're allowed once a year to, to review your credit reports. This is not actually getting your credit score. Um, you know, there's two, basically the way this all works is there's, there's three big reporting bureaus, right? Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. They collect all this data on you, what bills you've paid, you know, your mortgage payments, all this kind of stuff. And so they're tracking all that and they create these huge databases. And then there's companies that run algorithms against those databases, the big one being Fair Isaac, the FICO score, it runs an algorithm against those three databases and comes up with a score that banks then use to decide uh, whether you know you're credit worthy or not. It's called the FICO score. Uh, there's also now uh, an alternative called the Vantage score, which is a, a joint venture of the three credit bureaus because they were fair. Isaac was making lots of money and they wanted to get into that market. Um, so you do want to, uh, but, but, but you can't necessarily always get your credit score. You may have to either belong to a credit card that gives it to it, or you could pay certainly to get it. Um, but you are allowed for free to actually review the credit bureau reports to see if there's anything that's um, not correct. Like we had an issue with my wife. We went to get refinancing and we found out there was a um, medical bet that we thought was solved years ago that was still sitting out there and it caused us all kinds of problems. So, you know, had we done that ahead of time, we probably should have. It's probably what put, caused me to put this on this list. Uh, but anyways, it's a good idea once a year to go in, uh, go to, uh, I think it's freecreditreport.com and then you can pull your your uh, reports from the three credit bureaus. Okay. Uh, if you are, you know, using credit cards, uh, maxing out your credit limits is going to have a negative impact on your credit score. You want to keep your revolving lines, things like credit cards under 30% of your limit, pay more than the minimum due, just paying the minimum due has a negative impact on your credit score. And then obviously missing a payment going into default is going to have a big impact on your credit score. Okay. Just a, couple, just a couple quick points on college. You know, uh, if somebody's in college when you lose your job, it's tricky, right? Because if some of you are all aware, if for those who don't have kids in college, um, that the, uh, you know, the financial aid forms of FAFSA and the CSS are really looking back two years. And the reason they do that, uh, they switched it back in 2015, is because um, of so many students are now applying early, early decision, early action in November of their senior year. So at that point in time, Right. Let's say it's this year. Right. Um, so now we are 2022. They're applying for the fall of 2023. Right. And now the school wants to see their financial information. Well, they can't use 2022. Right. Because um, of the fact that the, the year's not over. So for the fall of 2023, they're going to go back and use 2021 uh, information. Right. And so now if it's a year from now and your students in school and you lose your job, that's the year you're paying and you're getting your financial aid but it was based on income two years prior. Um, and so, 
you know, if something does happen, if a change of circumstances, you certainly want to reach out to the financial aid office. Now, some financial aid, um, some colleges are going to have more flexibility to do typically the private schools they have more leeway in what they do. Uh, but you're certainly not going to get anything if you don't ask. Uh, so it's certainly worth asking the question, can you, you know, the aid package be adjusted based on a change in circumstances? Uh, just another, just a generic topic. Uh, really, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm not going to qualify for financial aid. You know, maybe I'm, I'm working these corporate jobs or whatever. Uh, but realize a lot of the financial aid that's given is merit based, not need based anyways. Uh, and what I mean by that is merit based is really just a discount on tuition. Right. They're lowering tuition to try to entice particular students to come to the school. Uh, it could be ac largely it's academics. Right. Generally, students in the top quarter of the class are offered usually fairly significant other than the top the elite schools. You know, top 20 schools, forget it. They don't give out any merit aid because they don't need to. They turn away 95 percent of the people that apply anyways. Right. Harvard, Stanford, schools like that. But but once you get out of that top 20, most schools you know, below that threshold are going to offer some kind of merit aid packages where they're trying to attract particular students to the school. Oftentimes it's academic based. They want, uh, you know, students that they're going to raise their academic profile. Could be sports, could be, uh, you know, things like music. You know, if the, the son or daughter is a violin empresario, right? The orchestra needs a violin player. Could be any number. It could be geography. That's a strategy that we took. You know, we still live in Minneapolis. Uh, schools in Minnesota really are not on the radar. Uh, for the students in New Jersey and New York, and they're trying to get on the radar. And so we applied to Minnesota schools and got good packages because they're trying to entice students to come out there. Schools in Boston, not so much, right? They're, they're buried with kids from New Jersey. So they're not necessarily, you know, coming from New Jersey is not something they're going to be all that attractive to them. Um, but, but you know, so it all depends. But look, so there's a lot of merit aid money out there and you just have to cast a wide enough net. Um, um, from my own experience, I, I, my daughter is a niche player in the creative side of fashion design and various schools. We talked to them about financial aid. The schools that were not playing in that niche didn't offer, you know, they weren't interested in talking to us about it so much. So that's why she went to the school she went to. Right. Yeah, you have to understand what what school is going to be in, for whatever reason going to be interested in your, you know, I, 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 I was talking to a. Uh, uh, it was actually in my church, but uh, a used to work at George Washington University in the missions office, and they had students from 49 states. And the only state they didn't have a student from was Wyoming. And they were like, if a student from Wyoming applies, okay, so we can say all 50 states are here at GW, right? We'll offer them whatever they want to come, right? So we can say that. You just never know what it is that they're going to want. Um, and then, as I talked about earl uh, earlier, if you you can you can avoid a 10% penalty uh, on distributions from an IRA if you if it's used for choir, qualified higher education. But just be a little bit careful. You don't want it. You're typically going to want to do that in the later years because of that two-year look back on income. Obviously, if you take money out, if you're going if you are going to qualify for any need-based financial aid, this is going to affect it, right? Because that's income in that year. So you typically want to wait to junior senior year. Uh, where they're, it's no longer going to matter, right? Because they've gone back and used two years prior. Okay. All righty. Uh, this is kind of my rant on, you know, fees. Um, you know, just be really uh, cautious on fees that you pay for your investments. Um, people think, oh, I'm just paying somebody 1%. That's not a lot. But that 1% really adds up uh, over time. Um, and the first debate is, are you really going to get the money's worth out of the 1%? And the problem, of course, is it's really, really difficult to, to beat the market. Uh, and it's largely because it's a zero-sum game. It's not that the fund managers that are charging you 1% to manage money aren't really smart. The problem is that they're all smart, and it's a zero-sum game. So some fund manager decides, you know, today's the day. I've done all my research, and today's the day to, um, you know, I'm going to buy Apple stock. Uh, some other really smart fund manager did all the research and said today's the day to sell Apple stock. And on that particular transaction, one's right, one's wrong, and you don't know. So by definition, on average, right, across these fund managers, 50% are going to be below the market and 50% are going to be above the market because the market is simply the average of all these participants. Um, but that's before fees. They're charging you, you know, 1% or 0.8% or 0.75% or something to manage, right, to decide what stocks to pick. They're doing all that research. And the problem is they have to generate enough of a return, right, enough to pay for their fees. So in any given year, only about 30 percent generate enough to, you know, uh, beat their fees. And over time, right, it's not always the same fund manager in the same year, but over time, over 15 years, it's like 18 percent, some study that Vanguard did. So the problem is at the beginning, you know, you're trying to decide if you knew who the 18 percent were, 
that were going to beat the market over the next 15 years, you'd want to give them your money. The problem is there's no way to know at the beginning. It's easy to look at the end, no way to know at the beginning. And so it's generally a much better strategy to, to buy what are called index funds, which are simply you own the entire market. You don't try to decide whether GM is going to do better than you know Apple or whatever else. You own everything in the S&P 500 or the mid cap index or whatever it is. And you keep the fees really low because it's just a computer owning the stocks in the index. Nobody's doing any research or anything. And that's the approach that we advocate. And what's been proven over time is that the active managers simply can't uh, ultimately beat the indexes over time. It's just too difficult. And that 1% compounded over a long period of time really makes a difference. So, for example, on a $250,000 portfolio, a 1% fee uh, right over 30 years you know, would reduce any portfolio by like $600,000. So it could be pretty big money uh, that you're talking about over time. So you just want to be really, really uh, cautious and careful about uh, fees that you're paying. And then uh, kind of last rant I have is about Social Security. Uh, there's always debate about when you take Social Security. Um, and I, we, I can, we kind of think about it a little differently. Some people like to say, what's the break even? And the break even, say, between it, finding at the earliest possible date, which is 62, and the latest possible date, which is 70, is usually around age 79 or 80. You know, if you took it, if you die before that, you'd come out ahead taking it early. If you live longer than that, it's, you know, you come out ahead if you wait. Uh, but we don't actually even think that break even is the best way to think about it, because really the whole point of retirement is to not run out of money, right? And so I kind of created this little chart that says, let's say that you knew, right, that you were going to get hit by a bus at 72. You would clearly be better off, right, filing at 62 than you would filing at 70. And you can see that, you know, 70 is sort of the yellow box, right? And by the same token, if you knew you were going to live to 95, you'd be much better off waiting because, you know, Social Security goes up 8% every year that you wait and you get that higher amount adjusted for inflation for the rest of your life. So obviously, if the break even is 879 and you live to 95, you're going to come out way ahead. But the problem is you don't know, right, how long you're going to live. So let's take the scenarios where you sort of guess wrong, right? You, you, you basically file at 70, but then you get hit by a bus at 72, right? Obviously not a good situation from a life standpoint, but from a financial standpoint, right, the whole idea is you, if you saved enough money for any kind of reasonable retirement, you should not have run out of money at 72, right? On the other hand, the upper right corner which is really where about half the country takes it at uh, 62, right? Is really what I define as a large part of the retirement crisis in the United States, right? You've got a lot of people who took it the earliest possible date. They've taken a much lower amount. They're sort of stuck taking that lower amount for the rest of their lives. Oftentimes, one of the spouses will pass away, often the husband, and now the wife is trying to live on, you know, $24,000 a year of Social Security, right? So if you can wait till 70, um, you're generally uh, better, best to wait. Uh, now, a lot of people say, well, what if the Social Security is going to run out of money? Uh, really, the trust fund is, is it just so people understand how Social Security worked. Um, Social Security came in the 1930s, right? It's a pay-as-you-go system. The tax is being paid in and come out of your paycheck, go right out the door, right, to pay the current retirees. And when the 1930s, they knew that there was going to be a lot more money coming in than going out. So the excess got invested in what's called the Social Security trust fund. And that's been building since the 1930s, has not yet been tapped, although they're now saying that it's going to be tapped in the next few years, right? Uh, probably the next three or four years, actually. Um, and then if they don't do anything, that trust fund will be depleted by somewhere like 2036 or something like that. Um, but that doesn't mean there's just going to be no money in Social Security. You're still the people working in 2036 are still going to be there to pay the benefits for the people that are retired in 2036. So the worst case scenario is about a 20 percent reduction in benefits. That's the worst case possibility. And that assumes they do. Congress does nothing right with Social Security to to shore it up. Right. And I don't think they're going to do anything until they have to. But I, I personally, this is my, my opinion, not anything else, uh, that they'll eventually when push comes to shove. They're not going to give everybody on Social Security, right, every senior in the country, right, a 20% reduction. Ultimately, they're going to probably have to raise the retirement age. It started out at 65 in the 1930s. It's going up to 67. The problem is our longevity has gone way up since then, uh, and Social Security hasn't really kept up. They're probably going to have to go to 70. The other thing that I'm assuming you're aware of, they only collect Social Security up until a certain limit. I think it's like 146000 this year or something like that. Um, and then, so if somebody making 146,000 pays the same social security in as somebody making a million dollars, they also get the same social security out, which is politically how they sold it back in the 1930s. Uh, but the reality is if they were to lift that cap, uh, either lift it or eliminate it, you know, and they raise the retirement age, it would probably solve social security issues for like 50 years. 
Uh, I think probably we'll do something like that, or they won't do it, obviously, until they have to. But the gist of it is, if you can wait, uh, you're almost always better waiting uh, because, you know, again, if the idea is to not run out of money, uh, you don't want to end up in that upper right box, um, uh, you know, as you think. So, I, again, we look at not break even as the issue, but what is going to give you the, the, the best chance of making your uh, you know, retirement goals and having that higher social security takes less pressure off the portfolio from age 70 for the rest of your life. Okay. Um, and I think that's all we've got, unless there are uh, any questions. Terrific. So folks, now's your opportunity to ask more questions before we uh, wrap up the meeting. So if you're online, feel free to ask a question. Anybody here have a question? Certainly, yeah, this Bill, is a lot of information. Go ahead, uh, John. Yeah, uh, Bill, I, I wondered if you would take a general question about your clients um, and specifically regarding their incomes. I just wondered, wild ass guess, or maybe you know specifically, uh, what percentage of their uh, retirement income is coming from Social Security? Oh, so Social Security is a big deal, in all honesty, for virtually everyone except I have, you know, I have a couple of exceptionally wealthy clients. But for the most part, I mean, you're talking about even with clients less than, say, four million dollars, anybody less than, say, four to five million dollars of assets, Social Security is going to be a big deal. And the reason being, like, if you wait, so let's say you had two corporate people and right. And typically that's who people have four million dollar portfolios. Right. And so you had two corporate people working and they both wait till 70. They're going to have about $90,000 a year right now, maybe even more, more like $95,000 a year in Social Security income alone, right? That's a reasonably comfortable retirement just on Social Security. Um, so, yeah, you know, and I, you know, it depends on what people live on. But I think, you know, let's say 120000 is, you know, 100, depends on what people, I mean, I have a pretty wide range. But let's just say somebody wants to live on 120000 a year, 90000 is going to come from Social Security if they had two, say, corporate people. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a big percentage for just about everybody, just about everybody. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, I have, I have a couple clients that are, it's probably not, but, but you're talking about enormous assets then. Yeah. So social security is a big deal. Yeah. All right. Anything else? There's our contact information. Sure. I also have this little side. If anybody does need help with the health insurance, I kind of have a little side business help for people on Obamacare. I mean, the ACA. So they're welcome to you know reach out or even Medicare. There is a question coming in from the room. Hey, Bill, this is Bill Pagula. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Um, with the Roth conversion, uh, I understand that it's taxable. Um, what is is there any timing thing about when in the year you do it? Um, you have to pay estimated taxes if you do it early in the year? Yeah, you have to do it by December 31st. You used to be able to go and have what was called a recharacterization. So you got to do over. So let's say you did it and like, oh, that was a bad idea. Right. You could you could undo it basically before the end of the before the tax deadline. That no longer is an option. So you really have to do it by December 31st. So the clients where we're trying to hit a particular number for whatever reason, you know, because there's other variables to think about. Like in New Jersey, for example, if you could keep your New Jersey gross income, which doesn't include Social Security, under a hundred thousand in your married couple, you got a hundred thousand dollar exclusion, seventy-five if you're single. So for some clients, that's the target. Uh, as Sean had mentioned earlier, right, your capital gains are, are not taxed if you're in a 12% bracket. But if you go just above that, your marginal rate jumps way up to, 20, to like 27% because, you know, you got 12% of your income on that dollar of income, but it now causes a dollar of capital gains to get taxed at 15 that was otherwise taxed at zero. So in some cases, that's the threshold we're aiming for. Another case is just a tax bracket threshold where you jump from, say, 12 to 22. But whatever it is, um, you got to make those moves by December 31st. So oftentimes we're, we're, what clients will do is we'll do a tax forecast in mid-December. What were their uh, interests for the year? What were their dividends for the year, right? What what distribution value did they take? What was their pension? Whatever it might be. And we really try to nail that down almost at a dollar so that when they know exactly what Roth conversion that we want to hit so we, we can get to the number as accurately as possible. But you got to do it by December 31st. But if you do it earlier in the year, you have to file an estimated tax 
for the amount, or can you just let it slide until you do your taxes? Well, but you could withhold. Generally, you don't want to withhold when you do a Roth conversion, right? So you could take money out of the traditional IRA, do a withholding, and put the difference into the Roth. It's generally better because if you're trying to do a Roth, you're trying to get as much money in the Roth as possible. So you're typically better paying the tax on your own. Now, if that's the case and you know you're going to do it, that, and we know clients are going to do Roth conversion with a pretty good idea what income we're targeting, then we'll do estimated payments. Right. So in which case you do want to do it throughout the year, because with estimated payments, the timing of the payment matters. Right. So if you pay the right amount, but you pay it at the end of the year, you're still going to pay potentially a penalty. Whereas with withholding, the assumption is it was withheld evenly throughout the year. So if you do withholding um, in December, then it's it's basically assumed that you did that evenly throughout the year, even if you did it in December. But you generally don't want to withhold because you want to get as much money into the Roth as possible. Um, it all depends on your situation and whether you have the cash available to pay the tax or not so in another account. All right, we had a thumbs up here, so that was a, a thorough answer. There is also a question online from Charlotte Ann, and the question is, how is, I'm assuming Charlotte Ann, SS is Social Security. So how is Social Security calculated? How many years prior to taking Social Security can the individual stop working before it will reduce their Social Security calculation? Yeah, well, and, and GM answered, yeah, it's 35 years. So it, it takes a lot to move the Social Security number because it's a 35-year average and it is and it is uh, uh, inflation adjusted. Now, if you don't have 35 years of work history, you know, that extra year makes a difference because you, now you've took something that was at zero and made it a number, right? Something, right? And so if it's part-time, it's worth it. If you've got 35 years of a reasonable work history, then an extra year of working or not working really isn't going to make much of a difference. And I will also add too that not every year is exactly equal. There's an index factor that it puts on there. So like the earlier years actually count as more. So there's later years if you retire early, like five years early, let's say, those are all, all at a lower index factor than the beginning years. So yeah, because it's inflation adjusted, right? Yeah. So that like a, a 40,000 20 years ago is not the same as 40,000 today. Yeah, exactly. Okay, terrific, thank you. And I did repost uh, the information on the current slide, so the contact information is in the chat. So later we will be posting the chat on our group's website. And so if, you're, if you didn't get a good screenshot now, or you didn't download the chat, you'll be able to download it a little bit later. Any other questions, folks, before we uh, formally wrap up the meeting and uh, hang around for open networking? Going once. Going twice. Where's my gavel? We need more gavels. Okay, very good. Well, uh, Sean, Bill, thank you so much uh, for participating with our group as you have for many years. We're so appreciative of that, certainly. And you know, one thing I absolutely appreciate is this it was not a wealth management financial planning seminar. And that's exactly what we did not want. We did not want you know wealth management. We really wanted to become clear on you know different strategies that may be helpful to us and while there was a lot of information here maybe some of it was a little uh, new to you or, or confusing um, feel free to reach out to bill or to sean and uh, if you have a question or two and i'm sure they'll be able to uh, answer those right away so thanks so much for helping us uh, from financial planning from a job system, not just you know which funds we should buy so thank you for that uh, and uh, for what's coming up um, next week, we will be right back here. We will facilitate in person at the Princeton Public Library. And Alex Freund will be our presenter, career coach Alex Freund. And he's going to be talking about, sorry, but we found someone who's a better fit. Boy, do we help ha hate that answer when we are uh, interviewing or have, have interviewed. So he's going to be talking about that perspective. And he will be uh, live here. So for those of you that are able to come to Princeton, uh, the Princeton Public Library, please do so. You'll be able to speak with Alex before or after the meeting. I'm not sure if Alex is still on the call right now, but uh, you know, if Alex doesn't show up, I'll have a cardboard cutout. You can just talk to that. So at least there'll be that much. Um, and you know, we also have other coaches that are here as well. So when your meeting wraps up here, you could speak to one of our other coaches that uh, visit us as well, if that'll be helpful to you. So next week will be Alex Freund at September 30th. Sorry, but we found someone who's a better fit. The following week, Marty Gilbert will be presenting. I'm so glad Marty will be back. He'll be talking about 
30 ways to get unstuck. So, so glad Marty will be here. Marty will be presenting virtually from Chicago. He is from Chicago. So uh, glad that we're able to keep uh, these virtual connections as well. So that's what we've got coming for the next two weeks. Uh, this Tuesday, if you're interested, New Jersey Job Seekers will meet Tuesday evening at 7.30. I did post the connection link for that. It is a Zoom session, or it's actually a go-to-meeting session like this. Uh, it is in our uh, PhD of Mercer County LinkedIn group, so the link is there. Uh, I'm not going to read the link because it's really long and complicated. Um, if I get to the other computer later, uh, if I can, I'll put it in chat. But just check our LinkedIn group. I posted it late yesterday, so I'm sure it's on our third, fourth, or fifth item down. Just copy that link. Uh, so they meet on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month at 7.30 in the evening, so this Tuesday will be the fourth. Also visit our other uh, cousin organizations. Uh, PSG of Morris County meets on Wednesdays at uh, 9.30 in the morning, psgmc.org, psgmc.org. Also, PSG of Central New Jersey meets on Mondays, psgcnj.biz, uh, psgcnj.biz. They meet at 10.30. So great topics. Go to their websites and see who will be presenting to them. So uh, in the meantime, uh, we will keep the virtual session open for those of you who are online and connected to us. Uh, we'll just turn off the, the microphone here. Uh, the folks that are here in person will have our own in-person networking. But those of you online can still communicate. Uh, if Bill and Sean are hanging around for a little while, I'm sure you can talk with them. Uh, I, I know they're busy. They may not be able to stay very long. Uh, but we'll keep the session open for a little while longer. And so at the very least, until we get to see you next time, either virtually or in person, simply say bye, everybody.